Hi guys. So now we're going to finish up what we were talking about earlier, which was um, how we take the idea of projection onto an orthogonal uh, decomposition of a space or a orthogonal projection uh, and use it to develop um, solutions to problems that don't evidently have solutions. So if we're trying to minimize the distance between a solution to a problem we can get and uh, the sort of desired solution that's impossible, this is how we're going to do that. So this is the core of a technique called least squares, although Axler does not refer to it as that. Um, I'll show you how it works with matrices when we get there. So first I'm going to switch over to my screen. That's not it. Okay. So let's pull up in one note here. All right. So now what we're doing is we're going to take the idea of orthogonal complements and the decomposition of a space into orthogonal pieces, and we're going to use it to define the idea of an orthogonal projection. And so the picture for this operation is like this. You have some U. There's our space U. You imagine you have some vector V that is not in that space. And it's going to turn out to be uh, the case that an orthogonal decomposition of V into a piece that's in U and a piece that's in V perp is going to give us the piece that we want. So if we take V and we break it up into two pieces, so we're going to figure out a way to project it down here. And then there's going to be this orthogonal piece that points in the direction. So this vector W is going to be in U perp. This vector is going to be in U. We know both pieces exist because a space decomposes into a direct sum of u and u perp. And the vector that we're going to use for our least squares type or minimal uh, solution is going to be this vector right here. And that vector is going to be called the projection of v onto not a single vector, now, but a whole space u. Okay. And so we'll start with a definition. So this is the definition of orthogonal projection, which if you recall is one of our big goals for this section. So let's suppose that U is finite dimensional and a subspace. The orthogonal projection of V onto U is the operator P for projection, U for the space that it projects onto. This is a bounded linear operator. And we define it the following way. So we're going to take U, we're going to decompose V, the big space, into U and U perp. So uh, for V and V, write V is equal to U plus W, where U is in U and W is in U perp. Of course, we can do that because the space decomposes into a direct sum of these things. Then the orthogonal projection onto u of v is just equal to this u bit. And for all the words that we've written here, really the picture that we're describing is just this picture. So this vector here, this is the projection onto u of the vector v. That's the name for it. And orthogonal projections are among the most useful operators that exist. Um, they uh, you've actually seen them uh, frequently in the past in various contexts. Um, one of them, actually, we've been playing with already is uh, things look like this. So T of UV is equal to U0. This is actually the orthogonal projection. So another name for this operation here. This is the orthogonal projection onto U that takes V into V. Um, 
where u is equal to the span of vectors of the form one zero. So it's every vector that has a zero in the second slot. So it's spanned by the vector one zero. So this is the projection onto the x-axis. And you can see that's precisely what this does. If you use a, a standard Euclidean visualization of this, and you drew a vector, say, 3, 2, and then you looked at the projection onto the x-axis of the vector 3, 2, you would get 3, 0, which is this vector right here. And it's an orthogonal projection because we're just projecting down orthogonally into that subspace. So we've seen a lot of activity with this object in, in earlier classes, um, in other contexts. It's used all the time in physics without referring to it by name. So the big structural theorem about, uh, about projections, so the sort of projection theorem is 6.55, which is a giant list of properties that projections have. It's an enormous list, like F parts. Um, none of the individual proofs are terribly difficult, um, but we should list them out anyway. So suppose that U is a finite dimensional subspace. Uh, of a big vector space V. And let's let little V be a vector in big V. Then we have all kinds of things the projection onto U do that, uh, projection onto U does. First is the projection onto U uh, is actually a linear operator. Uh, second thing is, if I project onto U of a vector that's already in U, I just get U back again. So projection does not change the space. Notice that this actually means that P squared is equal to P, which is an operator that we've seen before. And in fact, on an exam question, I believe, this is the, the implication here is that P squared is equal to P. And in fact, this turns out to be a characterization of projections. Uh, C, that the projection onto U of W is equal to zero for every W in the perp of U. D, the range of the projection of U, this shouldn't be shocking, is equal to all of U. E, the null space of the projection of U, at least followed directly from uh, B and C. The null space of P of U is equal to U perp. So anything perpendicular to the space gets sent to nothing. And then F, V minus the projection of U onto, uh, or the projection onto U of V uh, is, I was going to write is perpendicular to V, but the way AXA writes it is in U perp. That should be clear from the picture because if this is V and this is the projection onto U of V, then the vector that's left over, which is V minus the projection of U onto V, at least if you believe my triangle picture is at a right angle. Uh, G, P squared U is equal to P U, as mentioned above. H, the norm of the projection onto U of V is less than or equal to the norm of V. And I, this theorem has a lot of parts, for every orthonormal basis, E1 to EM of U, the projection onto U of V is equal to VE1, E1 up to VEM, EM. So our standard basis computation formula. So projections give us a way to work basically directly with the orthonormal basis of a vector space or a subspace. And we get lots of information about how projections act on vectors in the space, how they act on uh, vectors that are orthogonal to that space. They're highly structured operators.
like much more than anything we've dealt with so far. And the fact that they have all these properties means that they turn out to be one of these central things that shows up. So we should at least talk about maybe one of the, of, of the arguments here. Um, most of them are one line arguments. Um, so let's, let's look at uh, how easy it is to show that the square of the operator is equal to the operator, right? So let's look at, at property, uh, property G. So let's let uh, V uh, be an element of V. And so V is equal to U plus W, where U is an element of U and W is an element of the perf of U. Then um, we can write that uh, the projection of the U squared of V. Remember, P of U is an operator. We we're trying to show that this is an operator in all of L of V, not just that it's equal to its own square on U, but on the whole vector space, this is true. So we're trying to show that P U uh, squared is equal to P U as operators in L of V. Okay, so I have to use a general element V here. Um, so P squared U of V is equal to P of P U of P U of V. And then if, since V is equal to U plus W, we know what the projection onto U of V is. That's just uh, U because V is equal to U plus W. And that's the definition of the projection onto U. And then by the property that the um, uh, U is invariant under projection onto itself, this is just u back again. So we started in u uh, with a vector. We project u into itself or into the space it already lives in. So we just get u back again. And what that says is that p u squared v is equal to u. But of course, it's also true that p u of v is equal to u. And so since this holds for all v in v, it must be the case that P U squared is equal to P U. Major fact about uh, uh, projection operators there and how to find them. Okay, so now let's talk about finally the ultimate problem. So this is our ultimate problem, which is how do we answer a question how do we answer a question when we can't answer it? What's the best we can do? So the idea here is, um, so we're gonna start with the impossible question, then we're gonna reformulate it in a way that we can answer it with projections. So the first version of this is the version we saw at the beginning, which was you, you're given some operator T that's in L of V. And you're given a B that's in, uh, that's in V. So some sort of, output, uh, a desired output vector. And you're given the question, solve T of U is equal to B. And let's take this one step further, right? So if, uh, remember the impossible question here is not that B was in B, it's that B is not in the range of T. So there's no vector for which, um, uh, for which B is an output of T. And yet we're being asked to find an input that produces that output. So the picture we have here is the same picture that I've been drawing, which is you think of a space which consists of all vectors that are in the range of T. And we have some vector here, B, that's poking out of the range of T. I don't know why I put the vector hat on there since we've never used it anywhere else in the class. And the idea is, that it's possible that what I should be looking for is the projection of B into the range. So this problem, the way it's written is impossible. But I could write a different question. I can write a different question, which is to say that I could write this question instead, which is maybe I could find this vector down here. And that vector is in the range. So since that vector is in the range of T, that's a problem that could be solved. 
in, in, you know, that there's a there's a solution to that problem. And so the idea is uh, sort of this idea is related to the idea of finding a closest vector in a subspace. And so this pink vector here, um, this pink vector, I guess we'll call this, uh, um, I don't know, W, W is a bad, a bad letter. Let's call this U for now. The idea is uh, I want to be able to say that the vector U is the closest vector in the range of T to the vector V. So that's the vector that gives us the minimum distance. Right, so I the, the it's the closest vector that's possible to get into the range to our desired uh, output here, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to um, we're going to look at uh, the theorem that, that that says that this is true. That in fact, this vector here, you know, what we're saying is that u, which is the um, projection onto the range of t of b is uh, equal to the closest vector to be in the range of t, okay? And so it's gonna look a little weird, but the theorem we're gonna prove is that it is the closest vector. So this is called minimizing the distance to a subspace. And then once you've proved this theorem, I'll show you guys what it looks like um, uh, when you're actually working with like, the matrix version of this. Like there's actually a formula you can use to actually compute this thing. So minimizing distance to a subspace. So the theorem says the following. Suppose U is finite dimensional and a subspace of V. Uh, and V is in V, U is in U. Then the distance from V to the projection onto U of V is smaller than the distance of V to any other vector in U. So this is an assertion that distance is minimized when the vector u is the projection of u onto v. Okay. It doesn't look like it says that, but that's what it says. That the smallest distance I can get, the smallest vector that I can get that connects v to the subspace u happens precisely when we use the orthogonal projection, which means it's this picture. This picture is the distance minimizing picture. Okay. And the idea of the, the closest vector shows up all over the place, not just sort of in these least squares, uh, minimization problem type applications, but um, more broadly in all kinds of approximation uh, uh, arguments. So let's actually take a look at this and see if we can do it. How can we prove this? So the distance from V to the projection of U onto V squared is certainly uh, equal to hmm. Well, I can add a positive number to that. So I'm totally allowed to do this. So now we're just doing raw analysis at this point, right? So this, this is where linear algebra starts to look a lot like analysis does. Because we're working with estimates now, we're gonna do things like saying inequalities are preserved if I add small number, if I add positive numbers to one side of an equation, I have an inequality instead. So if I take that same quantity, but I add some positive number to it, that's a legal move. 
Now the next move is going to say, oh, and, and actually, since I did that, since I added a small quantity here, th this is this now a less than or equal to because this thing is greater than or equal to zero. So I've added some sort of non-negative number to the right-hand side, and I've made the expression larger by doing so. Okay. Second thing, now I'm going to use the Pythagorean theorem to say that this is actually equal to this distance. So this is a Pythagorean argument. Uh, you can go through and check that this is true using the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, this is a typical application of the Pythagorean theorem. Remember the Pythagorean theorem says that a squared plus b squared is equal to a plus b squared. Sorry, the length of a squared plus the length of b squared is equal to the length of a plus b squared whenever those vectors are orthogonal to each other. And so it really just comes down to an orthogonality check. And then, um, well, these guys right here, That equals zero. So this is just equal to the length of v minus u squared. So this line held because we went by, we added a small uh, or small and non negative number to both sides. This line held by the Pythagorean theorem. This line holds by algebra. And so there we go. We get the length of v minus the projection onto u of v squared is less than or equal to the length of v minus u. And then if we take square roots of both sides, square roots are monotone, they preserve inequalities, we get the length of p minus uh, v u v is less than or equal to the length of v minus u. And the only work you have to do in here, I leave it to you to check, is that this line was justified where we invoked the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so the very, 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 very last thing that I want to say about this. Um, if, actually, what I'd really like to do is I'd like to talk to you guys about the spectral theorem and whatnot, is um, an application of this that, uh, that shows up in matrix uh, theory. You guys maybe uh, saw this in 206 if you got far enough, which is how can you produce the projection that you're after? How do you actually solve the equation um, and it turns out to be the case that if you're writing down a matrix version, so say you've got a matrix equation where this is true. So you've got an operator T uh, that acts on U and it's defined by matrix multiplication by U for some matrix A. It's not hard to see that multiplication by a matrix is a linear operator. So this does define a linear operator. T is a linear operator. on Fn. And uh, the idea here is that if you have some equation that looks like AV is equal to B, but B is not in the range of T, where T is equal to multiplication by A, then we still have the same picture that we want to draw. We want to solve this equation. We have a vector B poking out of the range of T, we have a vector down here that we can find pretty easily. This is the projection of B onto the range of T, which is a subspace. I'm allowed to project onto it. And so from a computational perspective, you think, well, how am I going to solve this? Like, I can do the projection, but that doesn't seem like it's going to get me any closer to finding the vector V. And it turns out to be the case that if you got far enough in your 206 class, you may have seen that the answer to this question is that you actually multiply both sides of the equation by the transpose of the matrix A in the case where the matrix is real. Or you can multiply both sides of the equation by the conjugate transpose in the complex case. And what you get out of this, these equations are uh, instead now, uh, the things that come out here, these are projections. onto the range of T. And these problems are solvable. And so even though this is not covered in Axler, I feel like it's important to point out to you that this is the basis for the method of least squares. This is called the method 
of least squares. And that shows up in statistics and analysis, physics, applied math, linear algebra. The idea is maybe I can use projection to come up with these approximate solutions. That is, I project the problem into a solvable problem. And then because of the minimization property, the fact that I've got the closest answer, so I project the problem onto the range of T, that's the best I'm gonna be able to do. That's the closest problem that I can actually solve. So I solve that problem instead. And then the solution that comes out of that doesn't solve my original problem, but it's as the best I'm gonna be able to do, right? So the solution to one of these modified problems, the solution to a least squares problem, solves the nearest problem in the sense that the, it minimizes the distance between the answer that you wanted and the answer you can actually get. Okay. So that, of course, is not covered on anything. It's not part of the homework, but it's such an important part of why we do this, um, the minimization thing. Minimization is, you know, projecting on the subspaces is incredibly important, and the, the minimal vector property is incredibly important. And one of its major applications is this idea that once you have that, you can project an unsolvable or inconsistent problem into a consistent problem and solve it. So I'm just going to emphasize here, this is not covered by Axler. But it was supposed to be covered in your, in your previous linear algebra courses, and you will see it again as you go through upper division mathematics. All right. So with that, the course is content complete. Uh, if you've made your way through these videos and I don't see you on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, I will see you in Thursday in class. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking about this with you guys. Uh, I think this is a really exciting part of linear algebra, and uh, um, I wish I could go on because the material after this gets even more exciting. So, anyway, I will. Uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Uh, thanks for your attention. See you.